Spanish is really scary to me. But I just stay on my bunk and just mind my business. It's like a fish in a tank full of sharks. A new inmate fears the worst. Being in a gang, it's not something that I choose to run behind. It's the choice that I made, and it's something that I joined. A gang member asks for help to change his life. But first, he must convince a staff member with plenty of his own experience on the inside. So they say, Ron, you don't understand it. You don't know, understand what I'm going through. I can say, wait a minute, I was here. I was in the same color shirt as you was, and now I know what it takes to live a better life. And... You die, heck yeah! He is very comfortable here. He's been here so much, it's like his second home. The most arrested man in Sacramento, heck yeah! Gotta be proud of something. Nestled along the gleaming skyline of downtown Sacramento is a block-wide, nine-story tall building that exemplifies the term, no frills. This is the main branch of the Sacramento County jail system. Housed inside are some 2,000 men and women, most of whom have only been accused of crimes and are awaiting trial or the resolution of their cases. One of two jails under the supervision of Sacramento County Sheriff Scott Jones. The downtown branch contains the main booking department, where new arrestees are processed, booked, and more times than not, sobered up. We have about 58,000 bookings a year in this county, and we track folks that come in to custody either intoxicated or under the influence of drugs. It's remained fairly steady. Between 75 and 80% of the folks that get booked in are under the influence of, of drugs or alcohol. Well, I see we have the usual cast of characters. They're under the influence, they're unstable on their feet. We're going to place them in this cell for their own safety. It's a padded room in there. Um, once they've sobered up enough to finish the process, they'll get pulled out of this tank and moved on. 13 hours earlier, the sobering cell was occupied by the man who has probably spent more time in it than anyone else over the past 20 years. Back by the weekend. <laughs> Chris LaForce was arrested for public intoxication. His latest probation violation on top of dozens of prior violations and convictions related to drugs or alcohol. His arrests are well over a thousand arrests for our county. Every time he gets brought in, he's very vocal, very loud. Heck yeah! Very intoxicated. He knows most of us by name. <laughs> he is very comfortable here. He's been here so much, it's like his second home. He's homeless out on the street, so th this is almost better than what he's got when he's out. I was like, right on. <laughs> Out on the streets, he's known for a drunken public, lighting things on fire, sometimes being combative, meth use, drug use, alcohol use. But he knows that when he does that, he comes here and he has a place to sleep, a place to eat. It's kind of a drag on how our system actually works, knowing that we're going to arrest the same person with the same charges over a thousand times. Other than that, obviously, bring him here, keeps him off the street, away from the public, so that's the good part of it. LaForce remembers the day one of his arrests made the local newspaper. That was in 856 arrests. The metro section of the Sacramento Bee mentioned my name five times. Heck yeah, they said you got her done. The most arrested man in Sacramento, heck yeah. Gotta be proud of something. LaForce has been homeless for nearly as long as his arrest record is old. His hundreds of mugshots represent convictions for crimes including petty theft, possession of ammunition, possession of a controlled substance, trespassing, illegal camping, loitering with intent to buy drugs, and most recently, arson, a felony conviction for which he is still on probation. That's a trash, piece of wood. The gasoline and rubbing alcohol. I quit drinking rubbing alcohol, start catching on fire, and it goes boom. Generally, the people arrested that many times are it's a lot of drunk in public. The judges can sentence them to county jail. They can uh, mandate that they take classes. They can put them into treatment facilities on the in the streets. One option for Sacramento County judges is called the Serial Inebriate Program, sponsored by a medical center and other local agencies. 
It provides a 90-day inpatient alcohol detox and rehab program, specifically aimed at inmates like LaForce, homeless men and women with an extraordinary number of arrests. LaForce has left that program, as well as other programs, several times now. Well, I couldn't do the program. I had to get out. I was in the rehab, shaking real bad. Said, this. I'm going to get a beer now. Because, uh, yeah, believe me, my alcohol. He's a drain on resources from getting arrested to medical staff talking to him or dealing with him, the courts dealing with him. And he has no intention of stopping. Get her done. As officer dog. Mr. LaForce. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Uh, yes, I know it's only been about five days, but, you know, rehab didn't work, so I had to come on back. You don't try rehab, that's why. He comes yeah. in, we still interview him the same way we do every single time, even though we know what he's going to say. Yes. You talked about wanting to kill yourself? Hey, no. Need protective custody for any reason? Not at all. No gang association, no any... No, 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 I made him easy. <laughs> okay, we're done. You got court tomorrow at 1.30. Okay, I think they're going to let me go. It's up to the judge. The judge is tired of seeing you. The, the judge? Which one? I don't know, all of them. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Okay, that was the interview. That's it for me. You're done, yeah! He enjoys what he does, and he'll tell you he likes it. He likes coming here, he likes seeing everybody. Does his thing, leaves, and again, I'll see you next week. You get tired of coming to jail? No, I actually love it. Are you serious? Yeah, it's home. Oh, this place home? Yeah, that's where I get my mail. It's, uh, it's been a long, winding road, but uh, it's not winding down anytime soon. It gets a little frustrating because the expense is all in the county for his, uh, whatever he needs, his housing and clothing and feeding and transporting him to and from courts. It's all expenses that are accrued by the county. I kind of like you brought the junk. Keeps me warm. It keeps me off the streets when it's raining out there. Uh, they feed me three meals a day. They're all hot. And the food's not bad. We have a Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous classes. Uh, Christopher LaForce doesn't want them. He's perfectly happy where he's at, doing what he's doing, but they are offered halfway type houses they could go to, social workers on the streets to see if they want those resources. But he goes to the same areas, the same street corners, bumming money and yelling at people, and uh, sometimes he's drunk within hours of being out. The force is assigned a cell, but a problem soon arises. He repeatedly jiggles the door handle as he waits for a control room officer to unlock it. As soon as LaForce steps in, officers on the floor see a problem and rush to the cell. He's kind of jiggling the door handle before it opened. When the door actually opened, LaForce stepped in. We could uh, observe his cellmate take a somewhat of a fighting stance and was obviously agitated. No punches thrown, but like they were almost just mad-dogging each other, and then we went up there and squashed it all. In May LaForce, he can be overwhelming, you know, especially for somebody who is having a hard time here. Nobody's happy about being here, but in May LaForce, he, he likes to live it like he's happy. He likes to have fun. He likes to enjoy it. And if people dislike being here and they're, they're sad or depressed about it, they'd get annoyed and it could cause an issue. Coming up. My little buddy right there, 1,800 how many? 1,087. Yeah, that's a lot of wrong choices. Chris LaForce runs into an old friend with a unique distinction of his own. And when I was locked up here, I was tired. They didn't have no programming. There was no classes for me to go to. A former revolving door inmate up, now helps others to stay out of jail. <laughs> While Sacramento County's main jail sits in the heart of downtown, 20 miles to the south, in the heart of one of the nation's largest and most productive farming valleys, is the county's branch jail, the Rio Casumnes Correctional Center. Turn right, go in between the car and the bus. Like the downtown branch, Rio Casumnes also houses roughly 2,000 men and women. But here, the majority of them are already convicted of crimes and serving sentences. That's due in part to a 2011 law 
known as the Public Safety Realignment Act, or AB 109. The catalyst for AB 109 was the state's mandate and need to reduce their prison population with haste. They called it realignment, the idea being to realign lower level offenders to a more appropriate custodial setting. What they did is take the responsibility for thousands of inmates that would have been going to the state prison system and just said, well, now they're the county jail's problem. The law created new challenges for the county jails by requiring them to house thousands of convicted felons who in the past would have gone to prison. With many sentenced to at least a decade, they could be more likely to cause problems. But the law also came with significant funding for a broad range of job training and rehabilitation programs to help inmates stay out of jail and prison. They're administered through the jail's reentry services department. The goal of reentry is to reduce the recidivism rate. That's it. What I call it is, you know, get out, stay out. Nationally, more than 70% of inmates return to jail or prison within three years. But Ron Smith knows it doesn't have to be that way because 10 years ago, he was a revolving door inmate here. I know that sounds like, wow, how are, how are you here now? Well, when I was locked up here, I was tired. They didn't have no programming. There was no classes for me to go to. Of course, I used to play the blame game when I was here. <laughs> the blame game is still going on, but there's really something to lock into that's real, that's tangible, uh, and they can make a difference. Smith was in and out of Rio Casumnes over a 10-year period on convictions including robbery, possession of a controlled substance, and possession of a stolen vehicle. He says it was all fueled by addiction, but he finally found help while out on probation. You know, I was on drugs and alcohol, uh, cocaine. Then I had epiphany. You know, I went to a drug program. And once I went there, they had, you know, introduced me to a new way of living. And since then, you know, it's just amazing to be able to walk around here where I used to be locked up at with the key to be able to help someone else. So they say, Ron, you don't understand. You don't know, understand what I'm going through. I can say, wait a minute, I was here. I sat in a, I was in the same color shirt as you was, and now I know what it takes to be, live a better life. When I was locked up here, there was no counselor for me to communicate with. There was no program in place at that time. But with AB 109, when they get out, they can be a transformed individual rather than just doing time with no rehabilitation. This is Fancher. Yeah, this is Ron for reentry. Yeah, I was looking to get uh, Mr. Greggs, and if you can send him to gate eight, I'd appreciate it. Sure. All right, thanks. Rodriguez Greggs was convicted a week earlier of possession of a controlled substance while armed and possession of marijuana for sale. He was sentenced to one year and will serve his time at Rio Casunas. It's my first time being here, so it's kind of scary being here with people who got all these type of charges. This doesn't even seem like a jail. It seems like a prison. And then a lot of people, like, they live like this is their home. I can't live like that here. I don't feel like this is my home. And it's just really scary to me. But I just stay on my bunk and just mind my business. It's like a fish in a tank full of sharks. I've been here a week, and I haven't, I haven't ate all week. But nothing tastes good. When I try to eat it, it comes right back up. And I don't want to be in the chow hall, and it comes up, because that'll start a problem also. There's a lot of politics in here, and it's just certain stuff you just can't do. So today's session, we're going to be talking about your reentry plan and what that looks like. Okay. okay. So what that means is we're going to take a look at some of the things that you want to accomplish while you're here and then some of the things you want to accomplish after you leave. OK, is that fair? Yes, sir. So we got you started in your classes. You'll be going to substance abuse on Monday. We got you in Think of a Change. Uh, Wednesday, we got you in personal development. And now, is there some things that you want to accomplish, uh, some of the things you're looking to get out of some of these classes? A better, a better, a better understanding on, on my thinking mm -hmm. and to become a better man and a better role model for my kids. All right. Because a good parent wouldn't be in here right now. We'll put you in parenting every Tuesday and Thursday. Overall, this risk to generally come back is high. 
based on him being caught with drugs and a firearm. So based on that, tells us he needs some type of assistance managing his life. All right, come on up. Since Greggs has already completed high school, he will start in the second tier of programming, There's personal no, development no, no. classes ahead, geared toward changing the way CPS. inmates There's think. Eventually, he could take vocational courses developed under AB 109, such as welding or computer graphics design. He will now transfer to a dormitory-style housing unit with other program participants. On the other side of the jail is a much more restrictive housing unit for inmates who don't qualify for programming, either because they have yet to be convicted or have had disciplinary issues. It's broken up with 26 tanks that uh, house from 8 to 10 or 12 inmates in each tank. There's one sink, one bathroom for 10, 12 inmates. They make do. Uh, life in here sucks. You got a lot more freedom in prison. You know what I mean? You get to walk the yard a lot. We hardly get yard, probably one time out of the week, two times if we're lucky. This is lockdown. You can't get outside these bars. There's nothing to do with him but read a book. And then you don't get any educational books at that unless you're blessed to have somebody send in something from outside. Jason Watley participated in the jail's programs during his last stay here when he served one year for credit card fraud. Six months after his release, he was arrested for possession of credit card making materials and must now serve an additional two years due to this probation violation. He says he's anxious to participate in programming again. On the other side of the facility, when you go to AB 109, the classes, which is really good insight on what you want to be in, how you want to finish the rest of your life. Definitely not this way. Oh, most definitely not this way. Hopefully, before my time is up, I'll be able to get back to the programs. Despite earning several certificates for his classwork, Watley says he wasn't ready to apply that knowledge once it was released. He went back to manufacturing fraudulent credit cards until an unlucky traffic stop led him right back to jail. I was driving a buddy to his house. Instead of slowing down for the speed bump, I went around it. That's exactly how I got busted. I had everything in the vehicle with me. And uh, looked like a real ass I got pulled over, so... As an AB 109 inmate, Watley could still get back into the programs, despite being rearrested. But other factors, including his ongoing affiliation with the Crip Street Gang, could get in his way. I'm ready for change, and being that this is a part of my past, it's hindering me from being something better in the future. I'm willing to hang it up right now, actually. For my kids' sake, for my family. Are you saying you're done? I'm saying I'm done. Coming up. I didn't leave the program last time with any intentions of stopping what I was doing. I mean, how did that work for you? Jason Watley pleads his case for a second chance. And later... There's a little spider. They all call me Spider-Man, Spider, whatever. One inmate's love of spiders translates into a profitable jailhouse art form. Inside the two facilities that make up the Sacramento County Jail system, 4,000 men and women sleep on steel bunks with thin mattresses. For many of them, that's an improvement compared to their living conditions on the outside. They were at one time or another among the approximately 2,500 Sacramento area homeless. I pretty much surrendered myself, you know. I wasn't really arrested, I was saved. Because I was homeless when I got arrested. I started living at, in an abandoned building. I had a couple blankets, and there was a chair out there, and I'd fall asleep sitting up in the chair all the time. And I was always on foot. My feet were always killing me. I always had blisters. You know, I was homeless out there, so I didn't really have a spot to be, so top thought that I was getting high, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what I call better than homemade, too. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a bum, but a lot of the people like helping me out holding the sign out and seeing the people looking past me and shaking their head going, no, not today. You're just going to go drink it up with it. Chris LaForce says he has been chronically homeless for the past 20 years. 
And then there's the people that drive by saying, Jesus loves you, Chris. And the kids are all waving to me, and that's kind of cool. I like that part. It just makes you feel good, you know? Just, just talk to them or having a pretty girl just smile at me is better than getting any money, you know? LaForce is back in jail for violating probation on his earlier conviction of arson. He hopes the force sobriety will help him reconnect with his mother, who he says he hasn't seen in 16 years. I just found out she's in Reno. I've talked to her a couple of times, but not too much. If I knew I would get out of here, get on the bus, go see my mom right away, no stops in between anywhere, I would not drink. I'm going to be on the streets for a few days before I go see my mom. You can't be on the streets without drinking? Or not at all. I'm an alcoholic, straight up, full blown, full blooded alcoholic. Get her done, heck yeah! When the force first arrived, he nearly got into a fight with his assigned cellmate. I'll go run into the lap. Now he's housed with an old friend from the street who knows all about La Force and his many arrests. My little buddy right there, 1,800, how many? 1,087. Yeah, that's a lot of wrong choices. But he's still not a bad dude. LaForce's friend has a distinction of his own. He only goes by his last name, Clayton, because his first name is an unpronounceable string of capital letters. My first name is an acronym. It's the first initial of all my brothers and sisters. D is for Dwayne, A is for Adrian, C is for Charlene, J is for Joyce, R is for Rana, D is for Dana. My father wanted a junior, so my mother named me after everyone. And a lot of times, people try to make it a name. They try and say, well, how do you pronounce it? You can't pronounce it. It's not a name. Clayton is serving a 90-day sentence for violating his parole on an earlier conviction for possession of methamphetamine. He has witnessed LaForce's revolving door relationship with the jail and recalls the time he returned, even before leaving the premises. The quickest when you sat in front of that door. <laughs> He said he did oh, not want to go. Oh, real bad. Yeah, he didn't want to leave. And he needed help. And he didn't know where to go get the help from. So I went and I sat in front of the jail. I had nowhere to go. It was raining. I just said, take me back to jail. I don't want to go He locked anywhere. the door where the officers go in to take you for booking until they came and arrested him. And he was back, like, within three hours, yep. four hours, something like that. You know, he's, he's like, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, you are. Your bunk's still open. <laughs> I've known him for what, about 15, 20 years? For good, good 15 years. Yeah, I've run into him on the street a lot. I, gives me yeah. shoes when I ain't got shoes. He always gives me something to eat. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. He, you know, I caught him on the light rail one day. I went shopping for me and my nephew, bought some brand new shoes. He jumped on the light rail. No shoes, no coat. So He's, here you go, He's not a bad guy. He needs a little help just like all of us. Like LaForce, Clayton has also experienced many years of homelessness in Sacramento. For 10 years, I was downtown. I used to love it because it was a choice I made. I didn't have no bills. I didn't have no overhead. I didn't have to pay no insurance. I had a tent. I'm get, I had food. I had friends. And if society looks at me and says it's not right, I apologize to you, society. Sacramento, you know, I don't mean no harm, but so what? <laughs> I'm still gonna be me. That's like, that's what I mean. Chris gonna do him. Thank you, Clay. Of course. My partner. See, there's no way to judge him. It, it, sorry, you know, it's wrong because he's just out there, you know, taking up space. But he's not. He's not taking up space. He is out there because he chose to be out there. Now, our community is just like any other community. It's just the homeless. We, our community stretches further than any other community I know. We go from California to New York. Any, any town you go to, there's homeless. That's still part of my community. Coming up. I got stabbed in the lung, in the throat. And in the job. The night Clayton decided he had enough of homelessness. And Rodriguez Greggs 
says no thanks to an offer to go home. I think in here they pay more attention to you and get to know you as a person instead of just, oh, as a convict. Due to mature subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. Morning at Sacramento County's Real Kasumas Correctional Center brings inmates to the outdoor rec yards. Once a World War II Army base, it's a hodgepodge of buildings, fences, and razor wire. The compound looks and feels more like a state prison than a county jail. And now it functions as such, thanks to a recent law that diverts thousands of convicts here from overcrowded state prisons. All these inmates will someday be released to the streets of Sacramento. So the new law also brings significant funding for job training and reentry programs in hopes of providing them the help they need to not return. You know, when I was locked up, I had no real motivation. I see now uh, inmates that have some motivation that something is out there to help them and to do something different. Ten years ago, Ron Smith represented the problem he now hopes to fix. He was a revolving door inmate here. Hi, Jason. Ron Smith over in reentry. Since then, he has gotten off drugs, received a college degree, and is now the jail's lead reentry specialist. Everyone deserves a second chance. I received that second chance. Sometimes they deserve a third, fourth, fifth chance. <laughs> I, mean, I don't believe as human beings that we can give up on another plan. human being. We must plan for our sobriety because it has so many negative consequences. Rodriguez Greggs, serving one year for possession of a controlled substance while armed and possession of marijuana for sale, is three weeks into a series of classes Smith has selected for him. Because if you make a temporary decision that you're not going to come back, Guess what? It's just only temporary. You'll be back. Greggs says he was recently given an opportunity to leave the facility on home detention, but has decided to stay. After I started participating in the classes, I gained a lot of knowledge, and that, that made me change my whole perceptive about the home detention, because they got the classes out there, but I think in here they pay more attention to you and get to know you as a person instead of just, oh, as a convict. So if you don't have the mindset to plan for sobriety, then you don't know where you're going. Your mind is like the map. Greg says there's been another development since he first arrived. When I first came in here, I wasn't eating because I thought the food was nasty. But I kind of got used to programming in here and doing what I got to do in order to survive. So I eat everything every day, every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Tastes better? Yeah, it tastes better now. <laughs> what I see from Mr. Greg's is I'm optimistic. I mean, that's the best way I can answer that question, because there's no concrete evidence that says, yes, he's going to make it. And here's the reason why, because he went to four classes here, and he went to, you know, parenting classes and the confidence, got a certificate and everything like that. And based on that, he's going to be successful. I wish it were that easy. Inmates who go through the reentry programs can still reach out to caseworkers for questions and support up to one year after the release. But Jason Watley is proof that it doesn't work for everyone. You know, you heard the saying, in one ear, out the other ear. It's hard to stop whatever you're doing and do right, especially if you're used to doing wrong for so long. Watley participated in reentry programs during a prior one-year stay here for credit card fraud. Six months after his release, he violated his parole when he was found with credit card making materials and is now back for two more years. And at that time, I wasn't prepared to come home and change. So I never said leaving that program, I was going to change and do something better. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, well. Watley has been assigned an inmate job passing out meals. It doesn't pay anything, but it has other benefits. I get to be out all day. I'm not locked up. Do a little work here and there. You know, it makes things easier. It makes time go by much faster. Tonight, I have to clean showers after everybody's done. But other than that, it's pretty chill. Watley says he would gladly give up his job 
to participate in re-entry classes again. He was in our program before. He did five months in it, so, and then he went out and he got re-arrested. Mm. Deputy Hamilton so, is one of the re-entry program managers. I get a lot of requests to go into the program, so I go out with Ron or another caseworker and we assess the inmates. We talk to them, we see where they are today, what brought them into custody this time, and yeah. what's the different. Try to assess whether or not they're ready to change. Yes, sir. All right, Ron. Based on their responses, based on my experience and the environment they're in, all kind of tells a story. And that story we can interpret to try to help them. Let's talk about what you learned from the program last time you were here. Um, you I gathered a lot of knowledge from the program. I just didn't, uh, I didn't apply it. I didn't leave the program last time with any intentions of stopping what I was doing. I mean, how did that work for you? It didn't work. Nothing worked. Nothing worked that my own, taking my own steps, and not following the steps that were provided for me, I chose to shortcut and not use the steps that were provided. Did you finish the parenting class? Yes, I did. Last time? Yeah, with Ms. Darla, I did. Right when I finished was close to my exiting date. I was told that I was going to receive my HALT certificate, but I know I didn't have enough time before I left. It was supposed to be mailed to me. I didn't have an address at that time. So I don't know how to go about getting that back. Or... That's focusing on certificates, and we're having a conversation in jail, and that's what we're trying to eliminate. Right. It's not about the certification, and you kind of proved it, but it's about transformation. Exactly. What brought him here? It goes back to criminal mindset and, and the cognitive skills and making poor choices. But, you know, if he's gang, then that's a lot. It's a huge component. Who you're hanging with, your peers. Have you talked to Officer Gillock about the Quest program? I haven't. According to Mr. Watley, he's a crip. Quest is a gang diversion program, so we're going to have Officer Gillock, who runs the Quest program, go and talk to him and see if, if she, you know, he's a good fit, good candidate for her program. I, I pretty much heard enough about this. I think so, too. We're going to go back. We're going to uh, talk your case over, okay? And then um, I'll probably have uh, Officer Gillock come out and speak to you. Okay. Okay. I see some inkling to want to change. He wants to do something different. Of course, when they get in this environment, they all want to change, and they have that spilled, if you will, to do something different. But where the rubber meets the road is when they get out. All right, have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Coming up, Jason Watley's future comes into focus. And... Got somebody new come in, put it on their bed, to wake up to it, it's a rat. That's for the newbies, though. One inmate's eight-legged infestation. Sacramento County Jail inmate Earl Herzog, serving 90 days for domestic violence, doesn't qualify for any of the jail's re-entry programs due to his short sentence, though he has used his time here to develop a new interest. I was a little spider. They all call me Spider-Man, Spider, whatever. Someone found the spider. It's been alive for about, I don't know, three weeks, almost a month now, a little wolf spider. I throw some fruit flies in here. He hasn't eaten for a day or two now. Um, guaranteed he attacks him. But Herzog is best known for a very different kind of spider. These are uh, toilet paper spiders. I use thread, toilet paper, and uh, hair nets. And some people like them colored, some people like them real looking. Uh, I prefer, I guess, color is a little more exotic, I would say. These do look real. Once you sleep and you wake up, and somebody new come in, put it on their bed, and wake up to it, it's a rat. You know? That's for the newbies, though. I'll show you right here. The, the first process would be we would start out on the legs. I read it, get it down as low as I can. I'll rip a piece of, the, a piece of hair net off. I got it already all set up, ready to go. Then I'll wrap it with the thread to get it as tight as I can. The thread comes out of the underwear. This is the part that takes the longest right here. I'll do four, and then I'll tie them all together. And if you look on these real closely, you can see that it's actually four instead of eight, and they're all just bent. And it makes it, it gives it that real look. The next part, I'm going to do the, the butt and the body all in one. It's going to add all the detail to the legs right now. I use coffee to color it or colored pencil if they want it colored. Now I'm going to tie the body onto the legs. I try to go, like, I'll crisscross. I'll go across. I'll just do a little bit of everything. As long as they're, they stay on tight, that's all. That's what I'm, I'm shooting for. And there's your sack counting toilet paper spider. 
Chris LaForce has been caught in a web of his own making. It's comprised of alcoholism, homelessness, and endless stays at the jail for the past 20 years. He also has abused meth, which has all but destroyed his teeth. I smoke it, and I eat it, and I shoot it up, and I snort it, and it all comes down to a little rock sitting on my tooth kind of erodes it away, you know, and sucking on one of them rocks, it kind of destroys my teeth real bad and puts holes in my gums and stuff like that. And it really is terrible, you know. Well, I'm going to be 43 next month, and I really want to stop this, this highway to hell before I end up in hell. If you looked at all my mugshots, you would see how I progressed from being a kid, being a dope fiend, became a real bad drunk. Emmy LaForce, on the surface, may seem like he's happy and funny and laughing and joking, but it, it is sad that he's been here so many times and that he feels as if we're somewhat of his friends or family. He's just unable to be rehabilitated here, and we're just kind of holding him in hopes that one day he'll learn. Um, but in the 1,087 times that he says he's been here, he hasn't learned. LaForce is currently housed with a friend from the streets, Clayton has also spent years combating homelessness and addiction. Yeah, I used to live right in front of the porno shop in a tent, right there, selling drugs and coming back and forth to jail for it. Uh, first, I used to sell marijuana. Then I went up to selling crack cocaine. And then I started selling crystal meth. And then, you know, I started doing the drug. And they had a saying, first the man takes the drug, then the drug takes the man. You know, don't be your, your best your best customer. Yeah, I was that. <laughs> I was my best customer. Did you ever sell to Chris? No. He has too many issues for me to give him another issue. He's a partner. He's a friend. While addiction is still a part of Clayton's life, he says homelessness is now in his past. I get help, and I pay my rent. I have a big brother who looks out for me, you know. About three years ago, I had a bad incident happen that made me have to get off the street. I got stabbed three times. I got stabbed in the, in the lung, in the throat, and in the jaw. And that Clayton says he was walking through a part of town where the homeless congregate when a stranger approached him. And he just stepped out from behind me, so, you know, just like another person walking down the street, he's just walking behind me. I didn't pay him no money. And it was like I felt a pinch. Then I felt a pull. And I, I was falling. And he hit me in the jaw. And I was able to fight back. And a lot of people were sitting there like, oh, 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 gee. I, oh, we seen that you were fighting. It looked like you were fighting for your life. I was stupid. Why didn't you help me? And that was it for me. I knew I, I can't keep doing this. We deal with people, so many different people, that a lot of times you think this person might be coming to help you, and they're not. It happens. They prey on the homeless. The force will soon be back on those same streets. Due to his current jail stay, he has 42 days of sobriety and will be released in another week. I'm about to get my head shaved and get my mug shaved. I'm going to feel like a new man. As he has upon prior releases, LaForce holds out hope of visiting his mother. Hey, you good sport, looking like almost a real human being, not part of the bushes. He says he has only spoken to her a few times in the past 16 years, and that she lives about 100 miles away in Nevada. It's going to be a real big emotional cry right there to see my mom, and I really love her a lot, and hopefully she'll take me back in, which I'm sure she will. Mm -hmm. She'll help me out with just about anything she can. So I want to get out and see if my mom will get me a lawnmower so I can start mowing lawns again, feeling good about myself, not feeling like I'm a bum or nothing like that. <laughs> we call for luck. Yep. I clean this up. Feels good. I feel like a new me. I want to get out. Maybe I'll just go get a lawnmower and try to be a different person. Not too bad, gentlemen. I kind of like it. Coming up, Chris LaForce returns to the streets. At the Sacramento County Jail's Rio Casunas Correctional Center, Jason Watley 
has been given another chance to turn his life around. I'm gonna back down. I'm gonna back down from everything that's wrong. Keep myself from coming here. At one point in time, um, you know, coming to jail was nothing. You know, we laugh at. I'd laugh at it. Uh, I just go do the time and come back home. Watley says he has decided to end his affiliation with the Crips and has been accepted into Quest, the jail's gang diversion program, co-founded by Deputy Gillock. They are busy all day during class with some curriculum that directly addresses gang membership, how their lives have been affected by gang violence. They also have access to parenting class, which I think every person should have. It also has a gang component in their curriculum. I don't want my daughter to come home and, Daddy, this is my boyfriend. And I look at him, and the first thing come out my mouth is, this mother is just like I used to be. Right. Or I am if I don't change. Right. This is Watley's right. second time through the jail's reentry program. After he was released and then rearrested six months later. In jail and being involved in gangs and... Th then in the class, I was just kind of cocky, arrogant. Like, oh, yeah, well, I can get this on the street. Then I would like to ask, where's the payoff? What's going to be the payoff? What are the end results? Leaving his gang could make Watley a target for violence. But he says he is sincere about wanting real change. Even so, he can't completely forget his past. Being in a gang, it's not something that I choose to run behind. It's the choice that I made. You know, once you join the military, you're gonna be a vet for the rest of your life. Although you, you're not in the services anymore. So, cripping is gonna be something that is a part of my life. I just, I still love my people, but I, I can't, I can't, I can't push that mo anymore. I can't push behind the movement anymore. And I see, I see the path in front of me. And uh, before it was dark, I understand what my responsibilities are as a man. Definitely not gang banging, uh, but I wish all my, all my buddies and friends luck. 20 miles to the north at the county's main jail in downtown Sacramento. Chris LaForce is about to make a transition as well. One he has made a thousand times before. Once I start being a cunning person, like God wants me to be, then it's going to change my life a little bit better. The day has arrived for his release. Surveillance cameras capture LaForce in his changeout cell and later making his way off the grounds of the jail. LaForce says his goal is to reconnect with his mother. But 36 hours later, he was back in jail. You be home again? 36 whole hours? You were gone 36 hours. I got me that long. What happened? I got drunk and died again, you know. So you were using two? Me, like, yeah. Christopher LaForce uh, was brought back into custody last night for being drunk in public. What number of arrests was this man? 1,088. What the f Yeah. You're proud of that? I mean, when you, when you get kind of retarded like me, you know, mentally ill a little bit, you know, and heck yeah, I'm proud of it. Nobody else has ever done it. I just want to stay in jail forever. I'm a force. Yes. Come to control. Roll everything up. La Force's latest violation will result in another 180 days in jail. A new chance to yes. sober up, and perhaps someday to see his mother. Heck yeah. NBC takes you behind the walls of America's most notorious prisons into a world of chaos and danger. Now, the scenes you've never seen. Lock up raw. For most inmates, life boils down to three words. The first is respect. You're going to do time in prison. Respect is the only thing that matters. The second, reputation. Every time somebody's body comes messing up, they say, I do. Just because I'm Duke or Love. The third, revenge. If you cross me, I'm going to give it to you, you know what I mean? Because I'm a good mother. You know how I'm going to beat your ass. Just about every inmate story we tell on Lockup revolves around the three R's. 
respect, reputation, and revenge. And at Indiana State Prison, we met one inmate whose story revolved around his search for all three. Hello, Joe Wagon. During our shoot at Indiana State Prison, officials allowed us to give select inmates handheld cameras to express personal thoughts in the privacy of their cells. My name is Cetus Pasco, C E P H I S E A S C O. I'm a convict at the Indiana State Prison. We learned a lot from them, including the importance of reputation in prison. I've done the time, I've stayed out of trouble, I'm not a punk, bitch, or any of the lesser areas of being in prison. Two things that were notable about Zephus. He was always alone. I don't think I ever saw him hanging out with another inmate. And his fixation on food, whenever he bumped into him, he was either talking about food, looking forward to his next meal. Breakfast is uh, 6.15 in the morning, and the chow for lunch is about 12, give or take, and supper's 5.30, give or take. They're giving us uh, reruns, two nights in a row. And if I only had pork chops, I'd really be going. He had these little rituals that he would do with his food. He would get himself almost like he was sitting in a barca lounger at home with a big TV tray, and he'd store up his food from all day long and sit there and just eat it happily in front of the TV screen. This is how I sit all the time when I'm watching TV. In the old days, I had pork chops. I'd really put on this show. I'd have nine, ten pork chops, chips, old beans laid out, six-pack soda. Guys, Pasco, you know what? Well, only fights I got left. But if we initially saw Pasco as a foodie behind bars, the footage he recorded on the camera we gave him revealed a troubled past. I'm in prison for 60 year bid for murder. I killed my nephew's ex wife. I was drunk, high on uh, marijuana at the time. I'm not the boy that I was. 20 years later, I'm a man. I live my life as a man. And here I am a convict. By Sifa saying he was a convict, he was basically saying his crimes were not against a child or of a sexual nature against a woman. And he lives by the convict code, which in prison is a big deal. The laws of the convict is you don't disrespect others, you don't steal, you pay your debts, you never become a punk or a bitch. I've done that. My reputation is clean. But Pasco's status as a convict was threatened by another distinction in prison's complicated social structure. Are those animals out? So we can go eat. We were interviewing Cephas at his cell, and he was anxiously awaiting the bell for chow hall. And he came out, and he was walking down. We were following him. I heard some inmates scream out something. I wasn't actually sure what they had said. But his reaction was so severe, I assumed it had to have been a major insult. Get a chow What? You call me that. He's talking chow Chomo is prison slang for child molester, but it can also be used to define anyone who has a sexual offense. We caught up with Pasco later that day. He was at the cell block microwave preparing his evening meal. You call that spaghetti? I call that just wet noodles. At first, Pasco was reluctant to talk about the earlier confrontation in the hallway. Let's talk out there later. Oh, I'm talking now. I've been down 20 years. I'm a murderer. I'm a convict. Nobody disrespects me like that. I got some little punk coming in. He's been in for a little time and run his little mouth. And Fine. That gets you killed in here. I'm a murderer. I'm a straight up convict. The more Cephas tried to convince us he was a convict, the more I wondered if there was something else going on. A few days later, 
Pasco told us what did go on the night he committed murder. I was at a bar drinking one night. I had nine shots of whiskey and several beers and gave a ride to my sister-in-law, I think it is, or something like that. Nephew's ex-wife. Uh, we, she lured me on to the dog town, which is the river camps, and we started to have sex, and she backed out of it, and we got into an argument, and uh, she started smacking me around, and I had a hair trigger temper back then, so I just snapped on her and went off. How the hell with it? I stabbed her, I broke her neck. And, Smash your skull with. Pasco claims his rage erupted because his victim rejected him and that they never did have sex. But some of the evidence indicated otherwise. Well, they turned it into a rape trial. They did their test and there was a presence of spermatozoa. And she was partially nude. Suddenly, I heard an inmate off camera yell something. And Cephas's whole persona changed. What are you looking at? Cephas. I'm marking someone. Why? Because he just said child molester. Uh, Break his neck. That's total disrespect for anyone in a prison, especially for somebody convict like me has been down for so many years and I got some kid talking trash. I know who he is and I'll, f I'll find him. I'm going to have a little discussion with him. Today? No, I'll find him. I'll wait till y'all leave. When I find a guy, I'm going to put him in a hospital. I don't kill no more, but I'm damn sure going to maim him. That's all it is to it. Later that night, Pasco again recorded himself on the camera we left him. He indicated that he had exacted revenge. At one point, I was uh, doing an interview and a bunch of wannabe inmates started yelling, Chomo, these idiots had to be taught a lesson. They were properly disciplined in the, the ways of we checked with the authorities to see if anybody had been injured that night, and there were no reports that indicated that. But later, Pasco shifted his thoughts from his tormentors to his victim. Many guys ask me why I'm doing this tape. The reason why is I want to leave something for my family, as well as for the Rosie's family. The victim. She was a good woman, a good person. And to snuff out that light was unpardonable. This is Stevens Pascal signing off from ISP prison, Indiana State. Coming up. If you cross me, I'm going to give it to you, you know what I mean? Because I'm a good mother. One of the Maricopa County Jail's most notorious inmates solidifies her reputation by entering into a forbidden relationship. Yeah, they wrote me up for um, being with an officer. At every prison or jail we visit for lockup, the safe management of the inmate population is the staff's number one priority. Violent inmates are usually confined to their cells at least 23 hours a day. When movement throughout the facility is necessary, it's usually under close supervision and with the inmate shackled at both the wrists and ankles. But at the Maricopa County Jail in Phoenix, Arizona, we discovered that for some inmates, even these precautions weren't sufficient. Here, a pod that would normally hold 32 inmates had been cleared in order to manage just four female inmates with violent reputations. It just limits their ability to threaten other staff, to go after the officers. It's just a very, very controlled setting. 
When I first went in there, I was surprised to see that there were only four inmates that were actually housed in that area. But once I met them all individually, my impression kind of quickly changed. And I realized that there's a reason why these four women are kept away from the rest of the population. The four inhabitants of this pod were all well known throughout Maricopa, but none had a more notorious in-house reputation than Rosalva Rosie Trevino. If you cross me, oh, I'm gonna give it to you, you know what I mean? Because I'm a good mother and, you know, I'll respect you and give you your loyalty, your understanding, your respect. I'll give you everything in one package. If you up little by little, then disrespect me, then I'm gonna beat your ass, you know what I mean? That's where I'm gonna come from, force your way. Trevino had spent the last six years inside Maricopa fighting a murder charge that could have earned her the death penalty. During that time, she was involved in numerous assaults on staff. Rude dude with the attitude. That's what they call me, the officers. <laughs> in fact, Trevino told us she couldn't even remember how many times she had been tased. My whole back, I have like scars. This is a big one. This one's where I could put my finger in. You see how big it is? I just didn't care. I was in there for the death penalty case. I didn't have nothing to lose. I mean, I have my family, don't get me wrong, and my son and everything like that. But I just had that mentality. So I was like, F that. I'm going to give him hell. Sometimes you get the nice, sweet Rosie if she wants to be nice and sweet. And sometimes you get the crazy, I'm going to kill you, Rosie. But Trevino proved that both Rosies could be equally dangerous. I want to touch it. And the staff warned me about this. She can actually draw people in, which she did on many occasions. And one of the stories that's very well known about Rosie among the detention officers is that she actually developed a personal relationship with one of the detention officers. She just we started flirting around and, I don't know, one thing led to another. I really thought she was going to set me up. I really thought she was working for the prosecutor. When Trevino entered into a relationship with one of the jail's female detention officers, it was considered a serious breach of security. Yeah, they wrote me up for uh, being with an officer and that I was a danger to this facility because of her, because she knew the blueprints or whatever, you know. An officer and an inmate having a relationship is a tremendous issue from a security perspective. The concern is that the officer can do favors or can even potentially smuggle things in to inmates, whether that be a weapon or whether that be drugs. They think that I manipulated her. Like, she never brought me no drugs or nothing like that. It's like food, like, you, know, you know, things. The inmates call that hooking an officer, and that's a game for them. And in the past, there has been contests between Trevino and other inmates to see how many or if they can hook an officer. She does have um, a reputation for actually um, you could say sucking the officers in, getting them to play her game. I mean, it's an easy enough thing to avoid, but some people just are weaker than others, I'm assuming. When the relationship was discovered, the officer chose to relinquish her badge rather than turn her back on Trevino. She moved in with my mom, and she's like, she raised my son. I mean, I cared about her, but I wasn't like, I didn't know how serious she was until after I had her in my house with my mom, and it was like, she helped my mom and my dad out a lot, and my son loves her. If an inmate wants to be your friend, that's your first warning sign right there. The officer in question, she listened and believed exactly what Trevino told her. You know, she said, yeah, great, wow, I'm interested in you, gets fired, comes back to be, you know, I guess in love with this young lady, and now Trevino's done because she no longer can be a help to her. She's no longer an officer. It's crazy, huh, <laughs> what love does. <laughs> Trevino says that although the former officer is still close to her family, the two of them have cooled their relationship. No, I wouldn't say we're dating no more. I mean, she went her way, well, my way. I mean, I'm looking at death penalty, you know what I mean? I'm, but um, I had good memories. <laughs> During our final days of shooting at Maricopa, Rosie Trevino continued to prove unpredictable. After a difficult court hearing concerning her murder case, she attempted suicide, though it was quickly thwarted by jail staff. I was kind of shocked because she was actually a pretty happy person. She seemed really comfortable in her environment. She seemed to have built a really strong relationship with the three other females in her pod. Then just days later, Trevino and her lawyer reached a plea bargain, which spared her the death penalty. She was sentenced to 18 years in the Arizona state prison system. 
coming up. I stabbed him in his lungs and his kidneys, and he basically drowned in his own blood. In prison for manslaughter, one inmate's past can come back to haunt him. Before I was a inmate, you know, I was a correctional officer here at this facility. prison, we often find unusual stories can be found in the most mundane settings. That happened at the penitentiary of New Mexico when we met inmate Daniel Rapatz during his shift in the prison laundry. We do the facility laundry here on a daily basis. One day we'll do yellows, one day we'll do whites, one day we'll do blankets. The leg irons are for security reasons. That way we can't run. There's really nowhere we could go anyway. Rapatz was serving time for manslaughter. But we discovered a different story in his past. One that threatened his reputation among staff and inmates alike. Before I was an inmate, you know, I was a correctional officer here at this facility, at, well, the penitentiary of New Mexico, you know, about 13 years ago. An inmate who was former law enforcement is going to always be perceived as the enemy as far as the other inmates go. So it's usually a precarious situation. Given his circumstances, I thought Daniel was pretty secure. Going from being a former CO to an inmate in the same prison where he once worked, I would have expected him to be a little more nervous, uptight, what have you, but he acclimated quite well. The officers, some of them treated me the same, some of them treated me different. For the most part though, um, I've always gone along with people. I came into prison and I ain't here to prove a point. I'm just here to do my time. Is it weird? Was it weird at first dealing with officers? Did you run into people you knew from? Yeah, I mean, I ran into a few people and that, and they just, hey, real pats, because that's what everyone calls me by my last name. What, que paso? What happened, you know? How did you end up here in the joint, you know? What happened? And I tell them, you know, I ended up wrong place, wrong time, and out drinking and using drugs and alcohol, and I messed up my life. As we continued to interview Rapatz, we learned that although this was his first conviction as an adult, it was hardly his first brush with the law. I just started stealing cars at a young age and breaking into schools. I broke into my junior high and my high school. <laughs> at 11 years old, I was living like I was 21. Between the ages of 13 and 18, Rapatz did time in juvenile detention centers in several states. But then once I turned 18, I got my files sealed and I actually got my life together till I was about 24. I did do good and I was trying to change my life around. With his juvenile files sealed, Rapatz had a fresh start at life. At age 19, he was hired as a correctional officer at the penitentiary of New Mexico. But for him, it wasn't a career. It was a stepping stone to the job he really wanted. Basically, the reason I was a CEO was so I could get the training I needed so I could work security at the casino, which is where I'm from, up in northern New Mexico. I knew if I came and did the academy class here and got all that training, that I would have no problem getting where I wanted to go work. Rapatz eventually landed the casino job, but he also began using drugs again. Rapat says he was drunk and high when he got into an argument that ended with him taking a life. I stabbed him in his lungs and his kidneys, and he basically drowned in his own blood. Rapatz was convicted of manslaughter, along with several other charges, including resisting arrest and battery of a police officer. He soon returned to the penitentiary of New Mexico, this time in a yellow inmate jumpsuit. People say you don't live with regrets, but anyone who says that's a liar because you do live with regrets. Because I do regret, I didn't even hardly know the guy. And I killed him, I took a guy's life that I didn't even hardly know. Rapatz's last day as a correctional officer was about five years before his first day as an inmate. He was hoping to stay under the radar, but he couldn't. The prison obviously had to put Daniel into protective custody because he was a former CO. And Daniel abhorred this because you're perceived in a very negative light by the other inmates if you actually have to live in protective custody. I don't like being in PC. I hate it. It sucks because I'm around a lot of people that are shady. You know, I'm not in prison because of messed up charges like rape or child molesting. 
I've never ever ratted or snitched on no one in my life. And he wanted to make it clear to everyone that he was being forced into protective custody by the prison administration, but that was not his choice. He chose to align himself with the inmates. He completely identified as an inmate. But Rapatz recognized that his past would always make his safety in prison a gamble. All it takes is one inmate trying to get his, his bones, what we call stripes. He might come try and hit me on the line somewhere. So, well, that's a chance I was willing to take. You know, I wanted to do a waiver. I wanted to be on the line. And, you know, whatever happened, happened, you know. Um, to me, it sucks. I'm not gonna lie, it sucks. It ain't no good. Here's the paperwork. I think back and say, you know, what did I do? You know, I messed up my life big time. And look at me now. Coming up. Cause the night center comes out blasting, yeah. I'm about as hungry as a Taliban fasting. So Rap like unites two gangsters, but age has them on two very different paths. Everybody's like that when they're young. They don't see the big picture. They can't see it yet. You know what I mean? They just, it's just whatever happens, happens. During our time at any prison, we meet inmates who want to share their talents with us. More often than not, rap is the artistic expression of choice. I ain't already done to me. Hell, my own gun to me. Pull the trigger suddenly. Locked up, locked up. Thinking about some things. Thinking about some things that never change in the game. My old ways have given me nothing but penitentiary as my meat nose to roof and spits right. My game takes flight. Love is just a feeling, but pain is life. And all the bad I've seen, I'm trying to make it right. With so many rappers to choose from, it's difficult to decide who makes the cut. I around with a chip on my shoulder, but now the that went from a chip to a boulder. I get solicited a lot by the inmates to hear their raps that they've been working on while they're incarcerated. In fact, it happens so much that I had developed a system for it, which is I use the associate producer, Jake, to audition them before hearing their raps. And if Jake gives them the thumbs up, then I'll, then I'll take a listen. The plan first went into effect at the Maricopa County Jail in Phoenix, Arizona. He kind of used me for the litmus test, so to speak, on if they were good or not. So. At one point, I was told, hey, come on up here. And I went up, and there they were. Cousin Ice and Duker Loke were two of the most interesting inmates that I've ever met working on lockup. Yeah, yeah, I'm Cousin Ice, and I comes out blasting, yeah. I'm about as hungry as a Taliban fasting. So just like the clumps, I'm going to fill my plate. Ghetto grinding all day, it's a crime buffet. I, I was actually blown away for being two different artists from two different locations. They actually worked well together. So just remember if you like it or not. If you floss what you got me in my bus shots, bus shots, bus shots. Cousin Ice is really 45-year-old Titus Fisher. He was at Maricopa awaiting trial on a charge of firearm possession by an ex-felon. Yeah, we make toilet music. You heard it up there, the, right on the toilet and the desk. You gotta make your own beats, you know what I mean? Uh, four, four, cock back on the beam, on top, ski, man, pro club, chuck, teed up. Need a boss on the hip, 32 in the clip. Had a chance to give me a couple knocks off a bit. Fisher's cellmate is 20-year-old Danelle Thompson, better known here as Duker Loke. I got a man. You got a man? Duker Loke is the South Soccer. Thompson was at Maricopa appealing two murder convictions that could land him in prison for at least 32 years. Keep the noise down over there. Rap has helped the two men bridge their generation gap. Trying to film The Sellies share one other thing in common. They're both members of the Crips Street Gang. But they were at very different stages in their life. Cousin Ice was no longer in love with the lifestyle. I haven't actually went out gangbanging, shooting at people just because they're from across town and all that. I haven't done that in years. But I still hang with my homeboys and, and you know what I mean? If something happened to one of my close, close ones, I'm going to have to help retaliate, you know what I mean? Duker Loke, on the other hand, was still caught up in the game. He was still infatuated with this romantic notion of being a gangster. What do you want for your future? Money, power, respect. <laughs> Top of the food chain. 
I think everybody's like that when they're young. They don't see the big picture. They can't see it yet. You know what I mean? They just, it's just whatever happens, happens. Having been in and out of state prisons in California, Fisher sought to share his wisdom with the younger Thompson. I doubt him out of situations in here that he was finna just react to some and, and I'm telling you, you can't always just react. You know what I mean? You gotta slow down, think about something real quick. And then he thanks me later on, like, yeah, man, you're right. I'm glad I didn't just do that. Yeah, he keep me cool, because I'm real high headed, you know what I mean? Quick to snap him somebody real quick. No problem, no, no worry about nothing, but he keep me out of it cool. Despite the fact that there was a sort of mentor relationship, you could see that Cousin Ice couldn't totally impart all that he had learned in his years onto Duker. It's a new generation. Gotta take all your old folks out. <laughs> Fisher told us the gang banging has changed since he was Thompson's age. We just wanted to protect our side of town, you know what I mean? Which, I mean, none of us own nothing over there, but we call it our side of town. When I was 18, it wasn't. You, you heard about somebody getting shot maybe once every three months. Now it's every day somebody's getting shot. Danelle Thompson can attest to that. He's been shot eight times. I ain't scared of death, dog. Death scared of me. Prosecutors allege that Thompson has been on the other side of the gun plenty of times. Besides the murder convictions he's currently appealing, Thompson was charged with three additional drive-by murders while we were at Maricopa. He has pled not guilty to the new charges. Cuz nice, cuz. Everybody that dies in Phoenix, he had something to do with it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Just cuz I'm Duker Love. Can't be. Every time somebody body come messing up, you know what I mean? They say I did it. But Danelle Thompson had other choices in life before he took on the persona of Duker Loke. He would have been a star football player. Duker had scholarships to, to colleges, running back. He chose to do the other, you know what I mean? So that's that's the mentality. Yeah, I was ranked. I was ranked in the nation and state, but I told the streets over that. Why? The streets attracted me well. I love the streets. The streets are my bitch. <laughs> what excites you about? Just the banging. The guns, the money, the killing. All of it. <laughs> but to Thompson's cellmate and sometime mentor, wasting such potential is the real crime. And that's something that Titus Fisher was determined to see not happen to his own children. He moved his family from California to Arizona to help him avoid a future of gangbanging. I seen my son getting ready to start when he was only 14, so I hurried up and got him out here. That's another reason I moved out here, you know what I mean? When we moved out here, I said, now you can, you can be whatever you want to be, you know what I mean? And right now he's straight A's. He hasn't got a B in like three years. He's straight A's. He's on the football team, he's a star football player, so he's, he's on his way to do something, you know what I mean? Thompson also has three children but their future seems less certain. Yeah, I had a son, he go bang with daddy bang. <laughs> really, is that what you want for him? Yeah, he'll do. He gonna live the same life, but if he chooses the other way, then, hey, go ahead. So for you, it's not a negative for him to spend a lot of time in prison, for your son. And it's not a negative for you either. Nah. In another context, in another environment, it might be a parent saying to their child, if you don't end up being a doctor, I'll still love you. With Duker, it was like, if his son didn't end up being a crip, he would still love him. Kill us season, and you know we push out the gang, gang to let our blue racks hang. Kill us season, so back, back, for you catch a full clip, and your family really feel it, man. I love the life I choose. I love I was born into it, you know what I mean? You gonna end up in prison or in that casket, you know what I mean? Kill us season, and damn show I'ma get away, controlling up all the evidence. Season. Coming up. I'm part of a pretty intimidating group. Like when we're on the yard, we're 20, 30 deep, uh, pretty big white boys. Nobody really challenges that. A gang leader with a twist. I was expecting this mean, tough, hardcore guy, and instead, it was this Tommy that we came to know. It's been said that inmates in maximum security prisons live their lives based on the three R's. Respect, reputation, and revenge. The same could be said of prison gangs. No matter where we're filming, whether it's the United States or around the world, 
gangs are a big problem for prisons. It's a secret society with a code of silence. But when we went to a prison in Colorado, Lyman Correctional Facility, we met a gang leader there that seemed to be a bit different. It might have had something to do with the two officers we met there. Those two officers are Lieutenants Jim Fox and Andy Piper. We're not going to quit coming in here and shaking you down, so you better quit. Don't look for sympathy. I'm not. Square yourself away. Check yourself. Knock this off. Then maybe you can get into a program. They were completely in sync with each other when they, when they were doing their work. They were obviously very good friends as well, but they were complete opposites in terms of how they looked, how they acted, their whole personas, but they were extremely effective at what they did. What did you do before corrections? Worked on a ranch mostly. This was quite a culture shock to me. And they drug me off the horse and put me in here, and I'd never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> Working on a ranch, what did you do? Roped, doctored. You're a cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> You're a cowboy. Basically. And Lieutenant Fox had that cowboy persona on the job. He always told it like it was. You're not going to manipulate the system here at Lyman. You're going to go through the process just like every other inmate that comes in here does. And if that means that you go out in population, that's where you're going to go. Lieutenant Fox was the more gregarious of the two, while Lieutenant Piper was pretty quiet. But when he did speak, he was very direct. You know, that's never correct. He could be tough. Are you speaking? Are you speaking? You're saying something. Don't. And sometimes he had a very dry sense of humor. You stay away from the ice cream. <laughs> One of the men's specific duties was to gather intelligence okay. on the prison's various gangs. We're probably unique in how we deal with the gangs out here. We've accepted the fact that there are going to be gangs, and there's nothing we can do about it. So we try to control you know, what they do. And we use the leaders a lot to control that. And they know that uh, if there's problems out here, they can come to us and not be a snitch. Um, part is the clout that they carry. Out on the yard, there's not hardly anybody out there that's going to walk up to a leader and call him a snitch. That's part of it. And part of it is uh, the rapport that we build over the years with them. Um, they trust us, and, 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 and in turn, we, we trust them somewhat. One of the gang leaders the officers cultivated a relationship with was Tommy Holloman. These guys, they know everything. There's a lot of rats at this place, so these cops, they know everything that goes on, pretty much. We had been hearing about Tommy Holloman for a while while we were at Lyman as the shot caller of this white supremacist gang. So when we first encountered him, I was a little taken aback. I was expecting this mean, tough, hardcore guy, and instead, it was this Tommy that we came to know who seemed shy, a little timid, a little withdrawn. I have a pretty good heart. My mom, she's, uh, you know, she's always had foster kids and she's worked in a group home. So, I mean, I've always wanted to do what she did. I've always wanted to have been able to help somebody and I really think I can. During our shoot at Lyman, Holloman was brought in for questioning when another inmate had accused him of extortion. Hey, Holloman. <laughs> Watching Lieutenant Fox deal with Tommy was very interesting. They had a certain rapport. I would almost call it a professional rapport. Go on in and have a seat. So you want to give me your story? Well, I mean, to be honest, I don't really have one. I mean, I feel like this dude is just trying to get out of trouble. He knows who I am, and I go under the bus every time. They each seemed to know what the other's okay. boundaries were. They talked in a very amicable way. And Fox was giving Tommy advice on how to stay out of trouble. If you're doing anything, quit. Why not? Go over there and lay low. You know they got a target on you. Yeah. Well, the good thing about Fox and Piper is they don't ask questions that they know that they shouldn't. They're not going to ask me straight out what happened and why. They're going to ask if I know anything about it. They don't push me if I say no. All right. Appreciate it. The extortion investigation eventually led Fox and Piper to conclude that the inmate who had made the accusation was actually angling for a transfer to another prison. And Holloman was cleared. But Holloman has had his share of trouble. He was originally sentenced to 30 years for assault and attempted robbery after he stabbed a man during a street fight. I was charged with first degree assault, which I thought really wasn't that serious. I thought, well, if it's not murder, then maybe he wasn't too bad. And it turns out that uh, I stabbed him in his lung and he bled out like twice. I had to go through a couple surgeries and uh, I got the uh, attempted robbery because um, I was going through his pockets. That's, that's where I found the knife. It was his knife and uh, took off and 
That was it, really. During his early years at Lyman, Alleman gained a reputation for violence as well. When you have a 30-year sentence, you have to go in with a mindset that you're probably never going to get out. Or if you do, you're going to be an old man. So you don't really care about anything. That's what you're supposed to do in prison. You're supposed to do heroin and fight and, you know, I mean, who gives a crap? So I did a lot of that. He was kind of like a Tony Soprano of sorts. And just like Tony Soprano, he was a very personable and likable guy. I mean, you know, kind of a mama's boy. And on the other hand, I probably wouldn't want to cross him. I'm a pretty big guy and nobody's going to call me out. I'm part of a pretty intimidating group, like when we're on the yard, we're, you know, 20, 30 deep, uh, pretty big white boys. Nobody really challenges that, so it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. All of it made it to the top of his prison gang, but then the unexpected happened. He caught a break in his case. A reclassification hearing on his 30-year sentence was influenced by an unlikely source. So the day before my hearing, uh, this guy that I, that I stabbed wrote a letter to the judge uh, saying that I deserved a second chance and that uh, I was given a long time and it's not fair because of my mistake that my family had to suffer and lose a son, you know. And, uh, you know, it was pretty amazing. And I mean, I had a lot of people, you know, they, they spoke at the hearing. The judge cut Holloman's sentence in half to 15 years with the understanding that any violent acts in prison would restore the original 30-year sentence. You get this whole new perspective. You get this chance at some kind of life outside of prison. But for Holloman, nothing seems certain. I get my sentence cut in half when I don't deserve it. I wasn't doing anything to better myself in prison. Just because I gave back all that time, you know, I'm still a convict now. You know, this is still my world until I get out. So, I mean, it was tough to balance that, to, you know, try to do good and better myself and, you know, hope for parole or something. But at the same time, you know, stay true to how I was schooled in prison and, you know, not kind of showing weakness and, you know, things like that. Here's why you're a conundrum. You, you certainly seem to be one of these people who has a lot of potential. Yeah. Certainly a leader. Mm -hmm. We've all established that. Um, you're smart. But you don't seem to want to give up a criminal lifestyle. So that's why I'm curious as to what you really think is going to happen in five years when you get out of here. Well, uh, uh, I'll say this. I, uh... I'm not going to let the hope or chance of getting out soon change how I'm going to do my time now. Because my reality today is this is where I'm at. When I get out, this is that's a different world. It'll be a different life. I'll be able to do different things, learn new things, you know what I mean? But my reality is this place. So why would I change that? You know what I mean? I can't. Because the minute I do, you know, I lose my identity. I was hoping for his sake that he makes the right choice because he has all the things where he could succeed on the outside. He has family support, he's a smart guy, he has a desire to change. So we all left hoping that he was gonna do the right thing. I can't think of tomorrow because tomorrow isn't here. I have to do things this way because, uh, you know, this is where I'm at. Coming up. All you could hear were the sound of birds, 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 birds. One of the most unusual prisons we've ever seen. While the pursuit of the three R's of prison, respect, reputation, and revenge, seem to permeate the lives of most inmates, our trip to a Serbian prison for lockup world tour revealed a potential fourth R. Roosters. We have been told that this is the prison that houses the most notorious criminals of Serbia. But you would never know that by touring the grounds of Zabala, a maximum security prison located in the Serbian countryside outside Belgrade. They had done the grounds up beautifully. And you heard birds everywhere. All you could hear were the sound of birds, 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 birds. That was very surprising to me. You couldn't escape it. The prison's garden-like grounds and collection of birds, including peacocks, were part of a renovation project. Prison officials felt that a relaxing natural environment could help their rehabilitation efforts. It did have, actually, a much calmer feel to it than I expected. You know, the, the buildup was pretty big. Serbia's biggest 
most notorious prison, and then here I am with peacocks and birds and cats wandering around. In fact, when we wandered into the prison shoe factory where inmate workers make dozens of shoes per day, the scene was more reminiscent of a Disney film than a prison. This is our pet, Kicha, called Kicha, yes. <laughs> this shoe shop was, was a pretty unique area that we uh, got to film in. And the, just the fact that all the shoes were being made by hand. And then we're in the middle of uh, a conversation with a guy and a, a parakeet comes and lands on the guy's shoulder. It just everything combined, it was just really, uh, really unique. And as a cameraman, you know, those are, are kind of the moments that you really look for and, and, and you enjoy filming. Kicha. We met one inmate, however, who seemed to have a closer connection to the birds than most of the others. I would see this guy off in the distance, and he was surrounded by birds, and he was surrounded by all different types of birds. And obviously I keyed on him because it was kind of interesting. He was interacting with the birds, and one of the staff members said, oh yeah, he takes care of the birds, blah, blah, blah. I then dubbed him the Birdman of Zabala. Rasha Radisov is serving 15 years for murder, a crime he claims he committed in self-defense. We have pigeons, various breeds, fancy pigeons, fantails, which are inside the cage right now. We have hens, peacocks, geese, roosters, and since recently, goslings. I feed them. I look after them. I don't allow a single bird to go missing. If a bird gets injured or ill, I report it to the administration. He told me that he could tell by the sounds of the birds, the different species, what was going on with them. If they were fighting, if they were mating, if they, you know, were friends. He, had, he said he really felt he understood the birds and that they understood him. It's relaxing to see all the different birds. We have a small pool for them here, and it's fun to watch them gather there, drink water, bathe, fly around. It was obvious he had a relationship with these birds. I, we were watching him interact. They weren't frightened of him in any way. Along with his unique relationship with the birds, Rasha had a unique living situation as well. He lived on his own away from the other inmates. He had this unique situation. He lived in this little shack on the prison grounds. He didn't have to dwell in the dorms or the cells. And his whole job was to take care of the pump system at the prison. This machine sometimes breaks down in this place. The other one can break down too when there's a lot of rain and mud. That's why I keep watch here. The fact that Rasha, the bird man, existed on prison grounds was unique for me in my experience. He could live on his own there. He had this little hovel of a home that he created. I, I, I've never actually seen anything like it, ever. 